So let's get started here. And first of all, I want to uh, thank everybody for coming today. Uh, the Future of Freight web series that we've been doing over the past couple of months has really been an opportunity to explore different areas of international freight digitization that we found interesting. We, we've looked at a lot of different areas. We've looked at ocean liner digitization. We've looked at it from the perspective of BCOs, from the perspective of startups, uh, from the perspective of platform companies like Alibaba.com. Uh, and, and I found almost every single aspect that we've touched on really, really interesting. Um, and, and there's one kind of general area that I've been particularly interested in that I feel like we haven't really managed to go as much into depth. And it has to do with, I think my background, I'm a marketer. And that means that we do buzzwords and you know we talk we talk and we put together presentations and sometimes uh, we have a tendency to ignore the fact that things actually need to work, right? It's easy to put together a, a presentation. It's either to put easier to put together a vendor deck, but when it comes down to taking a very complex product or platform or workflow and making it actually work on a day-to-day -day basis so goods get from A to B with minimum problems, uh, it, it really can get very, very complicated. And that's why I'm very happy uh, to have this very specific uh, or kind of very thinly sliced um, aspect of what we're going to be talking about today, which is the practicality of air cargo transformation. Uh, and, and I'm very happy to have today with us Amit Agarwal, who's an air digitization expert. That's literally what he's done for, for the past couple of years, uh, focusing on air digitization at large companies like DHL and Penalpina DSV. Um, so first of all, I mean, uh, thank you so much for coming. It's, it's really great to have you out here. Thank you, Ayatun, for hosting me. It's a privilege. Uh, and and the, the privilege is, is all ours, of course. Um, you know, one of the, the things that surprised me, I was just talking to Amit uh, right before we started. And I, I kind of, you know, I'll, I'll be a straightforward. We had a, a large pr uh, webinar last time uh, with the chief technology officer at Maersk and the fact that there's more participants uh, participating to talk about the specifics of air cargo transformation means that this is something that's really on people's mind. Uh, and, and I think it's so, so important to address it. And I'm, I'm really happy to have somebody who has <clears throat> experience in the weeds, but also more on the strategic level to talk a little bit today. Uh, just a quick reminder about what Freydos is and, and why we're talking about this today. Freydos operates two different business units. We operate Freightos.com, which is a digital freight marketplace, largely focused on small and mid-sized importers. And we operate Web Cargo, which provides rate management tools, multimodal rate management tools, as well as air rate management tools, and e-booking connectivity directly to carriers and specifically airline side. And this really looks more at that airline and freight forwarder side, talking about one of the most interesting aspects of, of international freight, which is very, very fast paced, very sensitive, high value goods that come to air cargo and how you make sure that the underlying um, aspect of connecting those rates, connecting those bookings, actually executing on them doesn't end up taking longer than the actual shipment and that goods can get from A to B. And, and where I want to start is actually not necessarily yet on the air cargo side, <clears throat> but talking about one of the areas where things tend to break down. And, and this is something that we've spoken a lot internally at Fredos, sometimes with some frustration when we think okay, the technology might actually be there, right? There might be very sophisticated technology out there that's running machine learning and AI and you know, very, very fancy buzzwords. But when you walk into an airport or did eight months ago, pre-COVID, if you look behind the desk, you'd sometimes still see uh, the people that are booking your actual flights working on blue screens. And for us, it always reminds us of the fact that technology is only half the battle, a really big part of the battle, particularly when you're implementing technology at larger enterprise organizations. And it doesn't matter whether it's a CRM or a rate management platform. Uh, one of the largest obstacles is really making sure that you integrate it into somebody's workflow. So before we even unpack uh, Air Cargo, I mean, let's start from over here. While trying to implement large platforms at large freight forwarders, what are the steps and the, the, the strategic steps that you need to make sure in order to ensure that you find the right platform, but also actually get people using it and make sure that they end up doing their job better as a result? So I think I would start with, like you correctly said, that uh, as of today, in today's world, technology is not an issue, <clears throat> means it can be selected. Um, so the most important thing is, or one of the most important things is the selection of technology, which fits the organization. But before I get into the specifics of uh, how to do it right, I just want to talk about a bit of basics when it comes to transformation and implementation. 
So many a times and many people uh, mix up transformation and implementation. Though implementation is part of transformation, they are not the same. <clears throat> A uh, lot of companies, a lot of people think once they have implemented, transformation is done. That's not the case. There was a study done where it was found that time taken to transform is three times more required than what is needed for implementation or developing a solution. Another important aspect is to have a good transformation and implementation is data and process standardization. Is everybody talks about data is the new oil. But everybody also knows that in our industry, the quality and standardization of data. So that's another aspect. Uh, another important aspect to me is communication, because like you said, you're a marketer, you throw in a lot of buzzwords. And if that sort of a communication goes to a ground level, people just get confused. They think there is another corporate tool coming up, which they will not understand. So any communication that needs to happen needs to happen at a very ground level that, so that the people can relate to it. Um, one other thing which people uh, need to identify and clearly communicate is the wow factor. What's in it for me? What is the issue being resolved? What are the benefits that are going to come? So people need to, it needs to be made a bit more concrete than just fluffy words where people don't understand it. So these are the some of the basic things which are required before anybody can start uh, transformation or in parallel can do start uh, transformation or <clears throat> uh, start implementing. Now, how to do it right? It's uh, pretty simple, though not easy. And I'm sure you can help me answer this question pretty well. Because to me, um, transforming or implementing a big project in a big organization is like raising a kid. Now, why do I say that is that whatever emotions a person goes through raising a kid, you go through the same emotions, joy, elation, frustration, anger, X, Y, Z, you name it. I I'm thinking of a, a lot of nights spent crying. And I imagine <laughs> that's also. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and um, I can give you a few examples that why do I relate to raising a kid, right? means when the kid is small, uh, parents do take care and support them in every way they can. It's the same with the project or the transformation. When it's in the initial phase, you need to take care of every aspect that it's going well. If a kid suddenly cries in the night, parents rush to the room. Now, if I relate to a transformation thing, if there are initial bugs or issues or escalations, if these are not addressed immediately, people lose belief in that product or in the process. Um, probably need to, uh, things need to be explained all over again and again, multiple times. Um, when we talk about expectation management, now again, coming back to relating to kids, right? So you might say to your kid that we'll go to Disneyland this weekend, but you take him to the park next door. There's a huge disappointment. Mm -hmm. So whatever is being communicated, if it's when the implementation happens, if the real solution is nowhere there, it leads into a big disappointment. Uh, from an implementation or transformation perspective, important is also to identify the influencers. So again, relating to kids is that you might say that Pope is so strong because he speaks, uh, eats spinach, right? Same is the case in the transformation or implementation where you need to identify influencers which you can use to influence other countries. Um, another key aspect which I think is being flexible as per the country schedules, right? Means you cannot be pushy every time when it's a peak season or peak time, you cannot be pushy about it because these guys have normal day jobs these guys are also responsible to bring the revenue and the profitability to the company. So from a corporate perspective, you need to have that flexibility, which you need to consider while implementing or transforming. Um, another important aspect to do it right is to identify the country leads, whom you can transfer the knowledge so that the support is at the ground. Um, there are situations where parents are in a tight, uh, uh, in a tight situation, and they might reach out to their parents to babysit the kid. Now, looking at a transformation or translating into a transformation or uh, implementation, 
this is escalation, right? You mm-hmm. reach out to management because you hit a roadblock. But I would highly recommend to use escalation pretty judiciously, mm-hmm. else it can backfire. And at some point, you let the child be independent when the support structure is in place. And that's the same thing happens in a transformation or implementation project. So from my perspective, key points to keep in mind or consider are patience, perseverance, foresightedness, anticipation, management buy-in at all uh, levels. Uh, We talked about wow wow factor. Uh, I would avoid corporate lingo because most of the people don't understand that. If you're having a discussion with any country or region, it needs to be fact-based because only then some uh, concrete actions can come out of it. And one key aspect which probably a lot of people forget is the culture of the people, right? Uh, Whom to push, when to push, when to step back. And there are cases where you need to accept the defeat because at times there is win in the defeat. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, like I said, it's simple, but not easy. And that's what I would recommend, or at least I take care of these things while doing a transformation or an implementation implementation project in a big organization. Thanks, Amit. That, that's super, super interesting. Um, you know, one thing that I tend to see during rollouts at large enterprise organizations, and I'm, I'm curious for your take on this, is that there's something about the the way that many freight forwarders are segregated globally, whether it's by uh, whether it's by the specific mode or by the specific region, and you end up having small little fiefdoms of of uh, freight forwarders or regions where they have one standard or they have one kind of local rate management platform, and and it it typically does become you know I, I always kind of see it like a game of risk, where you know you're you're trying to isolate whoever's in you know, that specific European country or in, in uh, Australia, and you're trying to, to take it over and expand. And, and I, I do feel like there sometimes is like this head-to-head clash where you have one very headstrong organization that's doing well from a, you know, from a profitability perspective. It's hard sometimes to argue with numbers, even though it's so clear that a winner-takes-all mentality where everybody's on one unified system uh, works better. And I'm, I'm curious, I'm, you know, I'm sure you've come across situations like that where you're trying to implement a corporate, um, a corporate solution while there's also regional solutions. And I'm curious uh, for your take on how you actually resolve a difference like that. See, freight forwarding is a network business, right? It's not a manufacturing business so that you can have your standalone factory and you can do anything. So important is to communicate the importance of this network. Because if an origin and destination cannot communicate, it's not going to bring the value. Yes, a country might be doing well, but there is always a potential to grow and do better. So the network importance needs to be communicated and that's how I would tackle it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much for that. And I think this is a a good segue into talking a little bit more about the specifics of the air cargo market and and kind of the the general trends that I think are shaping rate management platforms as a whole. So, you know, certainly at at Web Cargo, we tend to look a lot at at digital bookings, you know, direct bookings, direct pricing coming from airlines. And it's something that we saw a little bit of a false start in terms of takeoff towards the end of last year and the beginning of this year. And then, you know, COVID hit and and it basically wiped it out. And then the tail end of this year has really seen a very significant rise in in dynamic or or live pricing directly from airlines on the air rate side. On the flip side, it it certainly has been a very tumultuous year when it comes to air cargo rates. And as I say this, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's people that are uh, busily trying to email an airline or get on the phone with an airline to try to negotiate some more capacity because uh, everybody's struggling with, with this right now. And, and I'm curious from your perspective, how you see this change happening? If you, know, you look at this entire ecosystem that was built on the idea of negotiated rates, static contracts that you'll then quote to your customer, and maybe there's a little bit of reconciliation that comes in after that. But where do you see this entire direction of static rates or contract rates uh, and, and how that's actually shaping the way freight forwarders are doing business today? Um, see, static rates are not dead, and I don't see them being dead in near future, right? Means it's, it comes across a question to me in that when will EDI be dead, right? You have heard this question many a times, and it has been coming over years and years. 
and the reason i say that is that the static rates will be valid for big bsas and big customers <clears throat> having said that we also need to uh, consider that since vaccine is coming out pretty soon right everybody wants to block capacity at a static rate so when we talk about big businesses i think static rates will still remain but it's a good um, momentum that dynamic pricing is also picking up though i'm i mean i would rather use a word instant automated pricing than dynamic because i don't know how many airlines are doing a true dynamic pricing which as per my knowledge are a handful correct yeah. so <clears throat> but yeah. the reason i see it is a good momentum is because it reflects a good reality of the market and it takes away a lot of friction and discussion between an airline and a forwarder right and the reason i'm saying that is that um <clears throat> when rates are booming and there is a bsa which has been in place with a forwarder which is probably at a lower rate there might be cases when an airline doesn't uh, honor the bsa so you know the cargo is is not flown on the other side there would be situation when market is tanking where forwarder might not honor the bsa and they want to play the uh, ad hoc market so uh, this has led to a lot of discussions in the past and if uh, this dynamic pricing at least on the ad hoc quotation to start with can come into play that will take away a lot of friction and a lot of unnecessary discussion that is required and you are buying and selling at the market reality it's not a case that you know there is a discrepancy or a big gap between reality and what you have purchased and what you are selling mm -hmm. so i see a lot of benefits in there um on the bsa side i see a change coming It means there are financial uh, instruments in place or are being worked upon which can be used to um have a paper based contracts for bsas and stuff right and i think it's also a good mechanism because yes you can have a bsa which gives you a fixed capacity and firm capacity but what you pay is based on the fluctuation that is happening on the market mm -hmm. so i see that is a good change um are we there yet i don't think so uh, and when it comes to say um if you look at the freight forwarding industry right a lot of things are triggered by the shippers requirements so yes mean shippers like to have transparency but when we talk about or you know when we talk about dynamic rates or market reality rates at times they are not open for it because they want to have static costs they can um, book it into their pnls and stuff they don't want that uncertainty where they will have to forecast something which they can't right so if that sort of a change is required then it's a monumental task to do that but right. i see that change coming but it's not that uh, fast that is happening on the ad hoc i do see but on the fixed capacity not yet mm -hmm. you know how do you you know we we promised the the practicality of this how do you envision you know, from a freight forwarding perspective particularly on the ad hoc uh, live pricing does does present certain complexities right because internally at the freight forwarder you would get a specific price you'd pass that on to the customer and possibly by the time the customer is booked it's changed pricing you know has that something that you've thought about in terms of bridging that gap uh, to make sure that the initial price quote that you got doesn't expire right because obviously rates are changing so quickly nowadays uh, do, do you have any suggestions on how freight forwarders can sidestep that or or contend with those changes See, in the past means um, there has been always a request from shippers of bringing in the transparency they have asked for uh, are there indices in place which can be shared and as of today i mean there are instruments in place where a shipper can also subscribe to and this could be the basis of um, a contract or a rate negotiation right or over a period of time where is the same source which a shipper has the transparency where they can see how the rates are going up and down and the same transparency or the same information a forwarder has and that could be one of the um, starting points that you use a common index which gives the same information and same transparency to the both sides which can be brought in to have um, you know a fixed uh, contract over a period of time 
but with fluctuating rates. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that, that in itself brings up another very interesting question where, you know, if you assume, assume successful indexes in the market, they really provide full transparency. And you know, that's, that's probably just an earlier version of full transparency of rates within the market, right? Of actual door-to-door rates down the line at some point. Um, what value and, and how can freight forwarders, right? If, if you're literally just a conduit for the price with maybe a fixed markup, where do you feel like the freight forwarders really you know, need to leverage their advantage if suddenly that takes out a, a fairly large component of, of negotiation and of car- uh, provider selection? So, I mean, the way I see it is, uh, means not all airlines are prepared for it or ready for it. And um, like I said, means one of this uh, discussions, unnecessary discussions that happens that can go off, right? And like I said, means in the, in the market where things are dynamic, even a forwarder would like to have that pricing um, uh, advantage because then they can sell it accordingly. Mm -hmm. Else, it again becomes a back and forth topic between a shipper and a forwarder where a shipper would say the rates are these and the market says this and why I'm being charged this. Mm -hmm. And the other way around would be the same discussion between a forwarder and a carrier. Mm -hmm. So I see a mutual benefit, a lot of mutual benefit for all the parties in there. The only thing uh, is that everybody needs to come on table and be open about it. Mm -hmm. Is there a... You know, before you talked about the analogy of, uh, of raising kids, uh, you know, if, if I look at this kind of changing dynamic, a hybrid approach of static rates and, and dynamic rates or, or instant rates, as, as you called them, you know, we're in maybe the awkward teenage years of, of adoption, which really means that you know, any individual freight forwarder might simultaneously be juggling static rates. Probably today they're juggling static rates that are outdated, but you know, in, a, in a typical year, let's say next hopefully next March, next April, juggling static rates, dynamic rates, maybe longer term contract rates. Um, and I'm curious, you know, if you were building a rate management or implementing a rate management platform from scratch, how would that kind of awkward need to balance everything play itself out uh, in the actual specking or implementation? So if I understand correctly, I think, uh, means, um, see, the, there are, I'd say around, um, now 14 or 15 carriers who are doing this dynamic pricing, right? Mm-hmm. So forwarders can use this pricing definitely on the ad hoc side, which mm-hmm. gives them, um, you know, an advantage saying that, you know, <clears throat> that this is the market rate, this is the markup that we are going to do. Yes means for the big customers, I don't see the static rates going away. So from a rate management perspective, if uh, and there are solutions in place, where you can have your static rates and where you can also request online rates to airlines. So that hybrid model is already existing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I suppose. That, and, and from a rate management per- perspective, from the actual implementation of software or processes internally, do you feel like that actually, that shapes it or not particularly from, from a software perspective or from a process perspective, would it change how you implement a platform internally? Uh, the only thing, additional thing is on the dynamic pricing is that the users need to know how to request those rates and what to do with that. Mm-hmm. Because static is simple. Uh, and <clears throat> when as many more and more carriers come on a platform regarding the dynamic pricing, there might be different ways how to look for those rates and also see in terms of what are the options being offered, right? Means there are mm-hmm. carriers who offer uh real dynamic rates with capacity behind it. There might be carriers who offer uh, rates with some options. So -hmm. that's the only differentiation that I see, but from a rate management implementation uh, implementation process perspective, I do not see much difference there. Okay, cool. And and so so let's move on here. This is uh, one of my favorite charts and from a a, research paper by Transport Intelligence from a couple of uh, years ago. And I think it shows really, really elegantly kind of one of the limitations or one of the challenges in block space agreements and tenders in general, which is that a freight forwarder will negotiate rates and they're kind of left holding the, the uh, check or the bill at the end of the, the meal uh, if rates end up going up. On the flip side, there's some advantages if rates, if, uh, rates go down and they're passing those costs on to their customers. Um, and you know, we, we kind of touched on this uh, already, but do you feel like 
live pricing might change the way that um, freight forwarders approach their annual tenders? Uh, yes and no. And the reason I say that is that e-booking um, has been there. It has been a pain point in the industry. Um, the biggest pain point on this topic is that there is no uh, industry standard for e-bookings. And what I mean by that is that um, the information that one carrier requires is a different from another carrier. Mm-hmm. Even within one carrier, one country requirement might be slightly different from the another due to probably regulatory reasons. So that's one aspect. The second thing is that uh, still a lot of carriers don't have their pricing engine linked to a booking of the capacity platforms. So they're still separate. So on that side, I see um, it not going away soon or changing. And again, it's linked to the previous question, right? As you right. rightly said, and uh, means tenders uh, will still be part of the industry. Um, I see that um, only because of the big customers who like to tender and the same process, you know, it's the upstream and the downstream flow, you can say. Mm-hmm. Okay, you know, I'm seeing a question come in um, from Peter. D- do you see a growing application for forward freight agreements or indexation to reduce risk in the air freight market? You know, probably particularly relevant question right now as we see such strong fluctuations. I see a value in it personally. And uh, I'm a a big promoter of that. Um, Like I said, means I see so many issues of simple discussions, capacities not being honored or rates not being honored, which lead into uh, unnecessary discussions and waste of time. So if that sort of a transparency can come, and that's what uh, forwarders require. And if that can be in place and carriers are willing to do uh, it, why not? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I definitely, I agree with that. I do think there is still this underlying challenge. You know, I've spoken to a couple of, of large BCOs, particularly on the ocean side, who say that, you know, from the one side, live pricing can definitely reduce risk in some cases, but that they usually hit these orga- organizational challenges where, you know, their CFO will say, what's my landed cost? You know, g- give me a flat landed cost that I'm going to pay per unit over the next year. And they're almost prepared to pay a premium, pay a little bit of a higher cost uh, just in order to make sure that they have that stability when they're building out their uh, their Excel sheet for the next year. Um, so yeah, I, th- I think it's interesting to see where you know there's definitely these internal. Every, probably every operational person understands why there's some type of advantage, but sometimes it's really hard to make that case um, externally. Let's mo- let's move on because I want to be wary of uh, um, conscious of the time. So you know you c- you can't really talk about COVID, and we talked about about the fluctuations already. But you know, I think the most striking part, uh, you know, we've all seen it, my, my credit card has certainly seen it, uh, is, is that e-commerce as a whole has really taken off. And we're seeing more logistics providers try to extend into that last mile or e-commerce fulfillment area uh, and, and really deepen their involvement there. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious from, from your perspective, with freight forwarders eyeing e-commerce more and more, and I think this is a air rate management concept, but it definitely extends much farther beyond that. How can freight forwarders do a better job at positioning themselves in order to kind of get that uplift that's coming from e-commerce retail and which probably won't disappear in the very near future? Yeah. So uh, means e-commerce is a pretty complex space when we talk about similar to pricing, you can say. <clears throat> and um, I don't think so forwarders can do uh, everything themselves. Yes means they can get their shop more organized. <clears throat> but there are a lot of things which depends on a lot of other parties. Now, first and foremost is in which area of e-commerce does a forwarder wants to play, right? Do they only want to play on the main leg where they pick up a consolidation or a pallet from a consolidator and take it to the destination? So that's just the regular forwarding business, you can see. And the other is, do they really want to go into um, the typical traditional end-to-end e-commerce side? So there are, pro, there are cons and pros to both of them. Um, when we talk about the main leg consolidation, right, means there are challenges which lie today, which are mostly around safety, security, and risk. Okay, There are hidden commodities. There are uh, wrongly declared commodities. Um, there are co- counterfeit items. There are smuggled items which are not captured properly or they're not visible. 
right further uh, what customs requires information is they require the actual individual shippers information and that is not captured currently so from a forwarder perspective yes means the risk side or the safety side or the security side um, they need to do additional screening which brings in a lot of work even if they are getting the console uh, the pallet from a consolidator and on the custom side and to address the uh, topic of uh, delivering the information about individual shipper mm-hmm. there are some technical enhancements required on the tmss right so it's sort of if one wants to capture the individual uh, shippers information then it's sort of uh, you have a house variable and then you need to have sub house variables so that is the information that a forwarder needs to capture at least in the tms side and not all tmss are equipped for that and then transmitting this information to the custom so that it can be processed mm-hmm. but screening and uh, everything remains uh, still a manual process mm-hmm. and lot of times these uh, when these pallets are picked up uh, picked up from consolidators even a consolidator doesn't know what's in it right so breaking it down screening it's a complete manual process and that's all they can uh, forward it can do mm-hmm. but if they have to move to the typical end to end e-commerce space then they require a proper integrator setup where you have conveyor belts screening scanning and everything besides that from a forwarding uh, forwarders perspective there are countries where as a, a legal entity of a forwarder you cannot you cannot get into e-commerce business mm-hmm. so you need to set up a separate e-commerce legal entity if you want to start doing e-commerce business um, is is that common i know is that common in western countries is that a i know quite a few latin wow. america countries well wow, that's interesting yeah so yeah. there's a reason it's it's a complex uh, thing uh, and um, yes means forwarders can take care of the safety security and risk part and probably enhance their tmss but the upstream and downstream flow still is not under their control mm-hmm. yeah and, and you know all i can think of when when you're talking about this is that if if you take a look at the amazon job description you know amazon career website there's a whole section of of the amazon global mile kind of department that they're building out which really focuses on international freight forwarding and you know all this popping into my mind is it's either amazon coming into freight forwarding or the freight forwarders going into e-commerce um but but there's de- there's definitely a uh, a a pretty massive battle uh, lurking somewhere down the road yeah. um you know let's move on to we, we got a a ton of uh, very short questions uh, before this uh, started so i just want to make sure we touch on most of those uh so the first question has came up a couple of times is when you're building out or you know whether developing internally or sourcing a rate management or booking platform what are the key features that you look for i think it means some of them are pretty obvious right means in today's world whatever a person experiences personally on digitalization they want to bring the same experience on the professional side you know so the common things like ease of use lean and clean how fast it is how good is the response time but going beyond that is um, if i have to look at a rate management or a booking platform i would uh, like to see the coverage of uh, the airlines connectivity to tmss interface to self uh, service quotation tools uh, which a forwarder can offer uh, data standardization what sort of data standardization these uh, platforms offer uh, electronic workflows uh, whether it's a one stop shop like uh, it allows ad hoc uh, e bookings as well as allocation bookings same goes on the quotation side whether you talking about one lane or multiple lanes Mm-hmm. effort of customization and implementation uh support in terms of what sort of support does the platform company provides another important thing is analytics in terms of what sort of analytics uh the platform offers because if mm-hmm. there are no metrics or kpis which can be measured then there is no way yes you can implement the tool you can buy the tool but there is no way you can improve on the usage of the tool and last but not the least is the it security of course yeah, and and i'm sure if, if there's any way that's been trying to scribble down the answers while me was saying we'll we'll of course be sharing a video of this uh later on in the week um so you can put your pencils down um you know, my personal uh most important question from my perspective on it what is your favorite pizza topping 
Um, I don't like meat on my pizza. So I got I your pre- number, man. Me too. I I prefer mushroom, spinach, garlic, onion, bell peppers, artichokes, asparagus, all at the same time. <laughs> uh, yes, I've eaten uh, such sort of pizza as well. <laughs> That's a, a salad pizza. All right. Um, moving on to to the next question here. Um, you know, this came up from from uh, two different people that asked before. How feasible is it is it to actually roll out one global pricing methodology? So, um, means if I understand this question correctly, right? Means from a corporate perspective, there is always a guidance put out in terms of how the pricing methodology should work, right? means what could be the cost basis how do you can do how can you do mark up what sort of things you need to consider when different commodities are considered that's there so um from a base perspective that method methodology or standardization or guidance is all, always there but one needs to consider in terms of um if it's a market which is a heavy consolidation market vis-a-vis a back to back market then your pricing would be different Mm-hmm. there could be cases where there are government and regulatory charges then the pricing becomes different um <clears throat> so there are some of the aspects uh, the only thing i can say is in terms of from having a, a single methodology is there can be a guidance in place but from a corporate perspective you cannot define or tell them what the margin should be because mm-hmm. me being a corporate person i don't know what the market situation is and what sort of margins can be put so that mm-hmm. needs to be left local but yes the guidance can be in place which becomes the uh, basis of pricing so providing tools providing guidance but listening to the subject matter experts i think yeah. you know, going going back to your child analogy in the very beginning it takes a village to raise a child so it probably takes a a village to roll out a successful methodology uh you know moving on to the next question this this really jumps off of our previous webinar but as all um also oscar asked this question before in ocean freight carriers have definitely become more aggressive about working directly with the customers you know in air cargo this happened a couple of decades back and and was quickly shut down how do you see that playing out in the air cargo space um, see currently um if a shipper has to directly deal with an airline there are two ways to do it so either they have to set up their own freight forwarding arm for example like inditex or samsung mm-hmm. or and that becomes a bit too expensive or administrative heavy right or the other uh, aspect is um, if a shipper wants to directly deal with an airline a forwarder still needs to be involved to have a tripartite agreement now the issue in the tripartite agreement is the clear ownership of the responsibility is missing right mm-hmm. so even though shipper is dealing uh, directly with a carrier they still expect the forwarder to do the normal job in terms of if something goes wrong even though shipper is directly dealing with carrier or if shipper is not delivering as what was promised to the airline then airline expects that forwarder raises it raises it up with the shipper so those are things which needs to be resolved before this can happen or take traction mm-hmm. okay um you know i'm seeing a, a question come in <clears throat> which I think is interesting enough that I'll skip the the next question that we had uh in our interest of time. Uh how can a smaller forwarder compete with a large company like DHL or Penalpina who have instant pricing uh and very very large networks that are sufficient to meet or bre- beat the pricing from a smaller forwarder? Um you know you know what what tools does a small forwarder have or is the answer none? no i means as of today in today's world if somebody scouts out there's so many tools available and uh, means this space is getting crowded if you think about mm-hmm. the rat, uh, rate management side this space is getting crowded that means there is not enough consolidation happening mm-hmm. so every day you hear a new platform coming up or something happening so it's not a case that um, it's only uh, big forwarders who can have access to these tools there are tools available for the small, smaller uh, forwarders as well means it could also be a case where a big rate management company has a different offering for a big forwarder and they have a different offering for a small forwarder 
So mm-hmm. from a cost perspective, if the question is around the cost perspective and the solutions available, both are there in the market today. Right. Um, all right. You know, maybe may just time for for one last question here. Um, what do you feel like is the most effective way to get consensus for procuring new platforms or software internally? Um, so it means one thing in today's world, what has become easy is that there's so much technology around. So you know, the conviction part becomes easy that, you know, you need to digitalize and use the technology. But the most efficient way would be, again, if it can be um, pre- precisely detailed out in terms of what is this tool going to do? Mm-hmm. What is this going to address? And what the benefits would be? Mm-hmm. If those things are clear, then it becomes pretty easy to convince management on uh, buying or procuring or sourcing new tools. Fantastic. All right. Well, uh, you know, I mean, that was that was the last question here, and I, I definitely want to thank you. Of course, I've bit my tongue for for most of the webinar here, but you know, the obvious corporate shill here uh, is that Web Cargo does provide um, multimodal, error-specific rate management tools, e-bookings both for large forwarders and small forwarders, like that last question, um, please head to webcargo.co if you're interested. Um, but really, I mean, uh, I, f- I found this fascinating and, and I see from the number of people that stayed on until the very, very end, uh, I see that they did too. So thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate you joining this uh, webinar session. Thanks a lot, Ayrton. Great, and, and everybody will be uh, back in another three weeks. Our next guest will be from the technology VC side, uh, specifically looking at logistics technology. And then we, we have some other great guests coming up uh, down the line. We will be sending out the video recording of this later on this week. Um, So thanks again for stopping by and uh, smooth shipping.